the Altitude Research Center, we study how people adjust to hypoxia. That research impacts anybody that goes into the mountains, but also people that have heart and lung diseases, have cancer, have all kinds of other problems that cause low oxygen in their cells. And that is the focus of what we do, is understanding how our cells respond to low oxygen and how we can kind of counter the ill effects of low oxygen in all kinds of settings. As a climber and a guide on, on the high mountains, I mean, the, the work that they do here at the Altitude Research Center is, is amazing. I mean, I think there's so much potential for understanding our world and how our bodies behave in our world of high altitude a lot better. We have an altitude chamber at the Altitude Research Center, and in that chamber we can put research volunteers, and they can exercise at 16,000 feet and mimic the effects of somebody rapidly ascending into high altitude. We are the only center in the United States um, and really in the world that's dedicated solely to the study of how people adjust to hypoxia. Our recent work has focused on exercise at altitude, on our ability to predict who gets sick at altitude, which is of big interest to the U.S. military, and a recent paper that we just completed uh, it looks at longevity at high altitude. In six years of guiding on Rainier, I'd have, I remember one trip where I had two of my clients on my rope team. One was a 60-year-old grandmother of four who really had never climbed before, not a great athlete, not in great shape. And I had an ultra marathoner who, who was running 150-mile races in incredible shape. Well, long story short, he ended up getting sick at about 12,000 feet, couldn't make the summit, and this little old 60-year-old grandmother trucked to the top and stood on top of Mount Rainier that day. And, and uh, so to be able to understand more why some people are predisposed to do well or not well would be a huge help for, for the work that I do and we all as guides do in the high mountains. Doing really well here. Excellent effort, come on. We've been, done some of the first studies where we measure oxygen in the brain during heavy exercise, and those results have direct implications for how people will perform at very, very high altitudes. Our ability to predict mountain sickness has taken huge leaps and bounds since we've started to apply some of the new genetic techniques that we can easily do in a blood test to predicting who, who is a super athlete at altitude. And finally, our recent work doing a huge survey of all counties in the United States and looking at longevity showed a couple things. One is, eight of the ten counties with the longest um, uh, lifespan are in Colorado. Two, they're all above 7,000 feet. And three, um, if you live in those counties, you have a lower risk of many types of cancer, and you have a lower risk of what's called ischem ischemic heart disease. When there's no blood flow to the heart, you're not so likely to get that in these counties at high altitude. Our next step, now that we've identified that, is to figure out how that happens. Is it something about the altitude or something else in the environment that causes those effects? 1998, I was guiding with a friend of mine on Nevada Huascaron down in uh, Peru in the Peruvian Andes, uh, just under 23,000 feet. It's the fourth highest peak in South America. And we were up at high camp with six clients and uh, were informed on our summit morning that there was a guy uh, that seemed like he was nearly dead in the tent next to us, uh, or a couple tents away, and so we went and checked on him. We later found out that he had gone from sea level in Seattle to 19,000 foot Garganta camp on Waskaran in four days, four or five days. Needless to say, was not doing so well, and when we came upon him, he was kind of ashen gray, a uh, little bit of blue-lipped, but really looked almost like a corpse. Uh, we and had a very cold body temperature, couldn't get a pulse on him, just a real rapid thready pulse, put a pulse oximeter on him which measures the oxygen saturation of his blood level and we found that that was at 36, which if you, in the western world, the developed world, if you ever drop under about say 90, you'll be immediately in the hospital on oxygen, 8 liter flow, and so he was at 36, he was in very, very bad shape, cerebral and pulmonary edema and, and hypothermia. Uh, and what was amazing about that was, you know, you always read the textbook situation is when you start bringing someone down, 3,000 feet is the magic number in descent to get them back to a very stable state. And so sure enough, that happened exactly with Miguel. We brought him down 
from 19,000 feet by 18,000 feet, he was starting to be responsive to pain and, and uh, moving a little bit. By 17,000 feet, he could mumble a few words, and by 16,000 feet, he was completely alert in, in the litter as we dragged him down and, and doing quite well. And by 15,000 feet, he stood up and walked the rest of the way down the mountain. Just, just amazing textbook situation, but, uh, but definitely opened my eyes to how quickly and deadly altitude can, can be. So, if you ask about my advice for going to high altitude for the normal traveler um, or the adventure traveler, I'd say still today the best advice is don't go too high too fast. And the best way to find out what's too high too fast is to go slowly and speed it up until you start to get sick or feel any symptoms and then slow down or take an extra night to rest and recover. Being in a hurry at high altitude is almost always a bad idea. There, you can talk to your physician about drugs you could take that might let you avoid some of the symptoms of mountain sickness, but for the most part, you need to acclimatize and until we're able to develop an altitude pill, which we're working on, there is no pill that will make you acclimatize overnight. You really need time to acclimatize and there's just no substitute for that.